I appreciate your time this evening, so I am going to get us started. Good evening, everyone. I'm Christine Olson Schwartz, the Faculty Development Coordinator here at Regis, and I'm happy to welcome everyone to our first Pride Faculty Lecture of 2023. We're calling it Our Mission, Our Values, Our Classrooms. And this is timely in so many ways, but specifically, it was organized to coincide with Heritage Week. Yeah. Uh, we really wanted a time to celebrate and reflect on the legacy of the Sisters of St. Joseph and the values of service and unity. I'm letting everyone know that tonight's event is being recorded, and I will circulate that to all of you who have attended, as well as it's going to be made available to others. So thank you all for being here tonight. Dr. Erna Col Ernie Kalamati of our Religious Studies Department has brought together a really amazing group of faculty and staff from across the college for an important conversation during this Heritage Week. Uh, we're going to have an introduction by uh, Joseph Draper. Uh, I don't know if I see him in here yet, so I'll just give another moment for that. We're, of course, going to have some remarks and insights from Dr. Kalamati. We're going to have a roundtable discussion, like I said, with a, a wonderful group of faculty that have been gathered for this evening. And there's also going to be an opportunity for everyone here to add to the conversation, ask questions here at the end. Uh, Dr. Kalamati has told me that he really is encouraging this to be a wonderful conversation yep. among all of us. So, so I, I really do hope that you will participate, whether it's in that discussion at the end or, um, of course, in our chat today. So hold on one moment while I see if I see, is uh, Dr. Draper in, to, in here yet? Christine, do you want me to call Joe? I just texted him, Ernie. Okay. Oh, did you? Wow. <laughs> we'll see what, wow. Ahead. You are ahead of the game. <laughs> That's great. Well, well, I'm going to take a pause then while we while we wait for, for Dr. Draper to get in here for our, our introduction right. to uh, keep you all into another place where you're going to see this conversation hopefully continue, which is we have in a, the Associated Colleges of the Sisters of St. Joseph mm -hmm. is partnering with Regis through the Center for Instructional Innovation to try to gather some resource sources specifically for faculty to think about how the values, the mission, uh, the charism are going to show up in your classrooms. And so we're looking for faculty to contribute some, um, you know, some assignments, discussions, ideas for things that you do in the classroom. And so uh, as part of that, we really hope that, uh, you know, you'll, you'll of course contribute. Somebody has somebody has background volume oh, on i think i muted everyone let me just double check if you could all just mute for we've got a nice big group here so if everybody could mute your microphones that would be wonderful i think okay great i think that's everyone thank you arnie so We'd really like to have you contribute to that. Um, let me send you a link uh, in the chat once we get started here. That would be a form where you could submit, like I said, anything that uh, you think will kind of contribute to the mission, the values in your classroom. And this recording of our event tonight is going to be part of those resources because we know you're gonna have some really valuable insights uh, to share with us today. So we'll just wait one more moment. I don't think I saw Dr. Draper come in yet. Joe said a minute, one minute. So one minute, we'll wonderful. Him in one minute. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll start with 60 Mary Lou and countdown. Okay. <laughs> and it may be technical difficulties because at times Joe has said sometimes Wi Fi connections are not the easiest in his location in Maine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, so I am dropping into the chat that um, uh, link so that you'll have it if you'd like to contribute, or of course you can. Uh, after we've had the discussion today, we can uh, you can get the information, kind of get on the mailing list to be part of that. So I'm sending that out to you all now. And wonderfully, we have Dr. Joseph Draper. I'm letting him in right now to get us started with our introduction today. I'll give him a moment to get settled, but thank you all for your patience.
Hello, everybody. Hi, Apologize Dr. for Jason. the delay. Oh, of course. So we've just um, introduced everybody, so we're looking forward to your introduction here today. Um, oh, very good. <laughs> wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'll be brief uh, since I'm uh, uh, unfortunately delayed, but uh, I am very pleased to uh, and honored to introduce Dr. Kolamadi. Uh, he he has, uh, uh, in addition to um, graduating from rival schools like Notre Dame, uh, <laughs> where he received his uh, PhD as opposed to Boston College, uh, Ernie also hired me uh, back in 2007. And uh, not only that, but he was he was my mentor for many years and, is, and still is uh, an esteemed colleague I go to for uh, many things, uh, in, advice on in the early days on uh, what, what is the, what is a uh, mission driven way of evaluating students. Uh, Ernie's always erred on the side of generosity when it comes to uh, difficulties. And Ernie is uh, an exemplar in uh, peaceful resolution of con uh, resolution of uh, conflict. Uh, he when he uh, engages people, you always feel like he, he's engaging you with your soul. And the last thing I do want to say about Ernie is uh, the incarnate faith. It's it's a very Catholic faith. It's it's always very hands on. Uh, it always uh, assumes a belief that God's grace is emergent in nature and in persons. Uh, and I am absolutely delighted that that uh, um, to be able to introduce him. So thank you. Wow, Joseph, if I live up to a modicum of that. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. I'm going to uh, move it over to you now to, for, for us to get started here, Dr. Kalamati. Thank you so much. You're very welcome, Christine. And special thanks to Christine and Mary Lou for their work with Heritage Week. It has been an incredible gift to the history of Regis and to its future as well. And I wanna express a personal thank you to you both and for all of the above and beyond, Christine, that you have done for tonight's program. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, to all of you who have taken time to do this, thank you. It's not as though there aren't other things to do, and yet you chose to engage in this evening. Um, on a chuckle note, I think, what is wrong with all these people who have come this evening? Don't they know who is leading the discussion? Wouldn't that be enough to say, oh, I've got better things to do? So thank you, thank you, thank you, I'm honored. Um, this question of identity has long been a focus in my person and then in a lot of my research and scholarship. And so I'd like to begin in an odd way, I think, because I wanna talk about a disease. And I, you're probably thinking, what has that got to do with tonight's question? I refer to that magnificent, charming story that so many of us know out of the Jewish scriptures that has to do with the origin of evil. Chapter three of Genesis. What a matchless story, eh? Two unclothed people in a paradise setting who engage in conversation with a talking snake. And as I suggest to my students, what's your first clue, students, that this ought not to be taken literally? And they say, usually in chorus, a talking snake. I said, yes, among other things. But what's most intriguing with that story in my mind is how do we understand their failure? And I mean, there are all kinds of ways of understanding their failure, this source of evil. But if you remember the temptation that was offered by the snake was eat of this fruit, eat of this fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and you'll be like God. And you know the rest of the story. Eve eats, Adam eats, their consciousness is suddenly spiked. They're aware of their vulnerability and nakedness. They run and hide. And then we have a God walking in the cool of the day, not expecting them to grovel back to him. But in fact, this God goes to engage them where they are in hiding. We can talk about the failure as disobedience, lack of trust, all kinds of things. But one of the most insightful ways of understanding their failure 
was a teacher of mine who said they suffered from amnesia, a very acute case of amnesia. And what my professor was talking about was the invitation, the temptation was eat this and you'll become like God. Apparently, Adam and Eve had forgotten who they were. Because in the creation story, which you're also familiar with, humans are made in the image and likeness of God. There is already a likeness and they had forgotten. But tonight, we're focused on, as Christine pointed, a very critical issue. Our very identity at its core. What values do we hold? Who are we? What is our mission? What are we sent to do? Not just today, but also into the future. And as Christine suggested, I'm going to give just some opening reflections. This is not the classic lecture by Ernie or Joe or Sister Mary or anybody for an hour on a topic with questions and answers. This is just my firing up the engine and then turning to a classic conversation dialogue, which I hope will then spread to everybody here as an initial piece of what Christine and Mary Lou have properly said is going to be a continuing conversation, we hope. Why is this question so critical? I mean, it's critical for every group to ask itself, who are we? Where are we going? Where have we come from? Because it's easy to suffer from amnesia. And then we become interchangeable with any kind of other corporation or group. We are a Catholic institution of higher education that has been founded and sponsored by the Sisters of St. Joseph. What in fact does that really mean in terms of identity? To add even more urgency to the question tonight. Um, a few years ago, I addressed uh, a group of educators and administrators from across the United States who are associated with the Sisters of St. Joseph sponsored institutions. And I said, we're at a pivotal stage in the history of the Catholic Church. It's absolutely pivotal. And people who study the history of church are going to look back at this period we are in and say, we are either going to define ourselves into the future, or we will become simply unrecognizable in terms of who we are. What do I mean? For decades, religious orders of men and women founded and staffed institutions of higher ed in the Catholic tradition. Boston is noted for a number of them, and they were all founded by religious orders. For decades, and some of us are product of Catholic colleges, the presumption was just by going there and being in the midst of the founding religious community that had multiple members, whether they were Jesuit priests or sisters of St. Joseph. I want you to think about this from the 1940s of Regis College. In the 1940s, there were 80 sisters of St. Joseph missioned at Regis College. 80 sisters of St. Joseph. In 2023, there is one sister of St. Joseph and she blessedly is among us tonight. Those 80 women served as administrators, as professors, as support staff, as student service people, as sisters who directed dormitories and were present within the very residential life of the student. Whoa. <laughs> That's gone. And it's gone again and again across the country in countless Catholic colleges. I'm not saying there aren't some Catholic colleges that have some or many Providence colleges, an unusual one, 
They have over 40 Dominican priests, but that's a rarity today. So what good people we are now in is what I call the ultimate tag game. <laughs> the ultimate game of tag. I don't know if you have fond memories. I have fond memories of tag as a kid. It was fantastic because I, my family happened to have a, yard, a very large backyard where we could hide all over the place, which caused untold challenges for anybody who was tag, you're it, and you remember it. And how we ran like the Dickens to avoid being tagged. History, my dear colleagues, history has now tagged us. We are the stewards of the identity and mission of Regis. No longer can any of us with any authenticity say, it's up to the sisters to provide it. <laughs> no, it isn't. And by the way, in the evolution of Regis and all institutions they sponsored, it was always understood that the men and women who joined with them were in fact partners in the mission. But I think it'd be fair to say that when parents sent students to Catholic elementary or secondary or colleges, they identified the college with that founding order. And I think the common assumption, friends, is this, just by having faculty and staff and students in that immersion, it was almost like breathing the air that that religious order gave us. It was the environment. I mean, think of a group of dedicated women here at Regis whose community life was public for everybody. Their ritual of daily prayer, of Eucharist, their practices as a community were lived out daily among us and they wanted us to be part and parcel of it. We aren't members of a religious community, but are there aspects that fall to us that we are absolutely challenged to live out? And the answer is, I think we must, or we fail miserably at maintaining who we really are. I don't think Regis will ever stop being a good college. The question to me is, will we in the future be a good college with a very distinctive identity that sets us apart? And I think that's what everybody here tonight wants. And my hunch is for those of you who are part and parcel of the faculty and staff of Regis, it's part of what drew you here. Or even if it wasn't primary, it's something you value. Otherwise, you wouldn't even be here tonight if the question didn't matter. So for a few minutes, let me offer you just a few highlights of what the best of the Catholic tradition and its connection with the intellectual tradition is. And then I'm going to turn to kind colleagues whom I've not paid, who kindly agreed they would become conversationalists and play tag with each other around some basic questions. And then we'd like to open it up as a model dialogue for all of us tonight. And if I could add this, may I quote Angel Gabriel, who in the encounter with Mary said, be not afraid. Please don't be afraid of being honest with your comments. It is so crucial, especially at a Catholic college that we speak honestly, whatever good we wish to recognize. And then I will also ask the assessment, where are we not so good so that we can become better? Be not afraid. So what are some assets, as I call them, of the Catholic tradition? At the heart of the Catholic imagination or the way in which Catholics ought to see the world, and by the way, I am not saying this is always lived out well, 
And I'm not saying everyone or even ordained people always get it. But from the best of the minds, historians and theologians, here are a few that mark us for who we are. And by the way, that's the largest circle. Namely, we are Catholic. My comments are not to suggest that the Protestant imagination is less or that other religious traditions and imaginations are less. I'm just going to try to highlight something distinctive about what makes us who we are. And I begin with this one. Catholic theology at its best, a Catholic set of lenses, sees life in sacramental ways. And in a very simplified form, it's this. Sacrament is sign. And what is it the sign of? It is the sign of the sacred. It is the sign of the presence of God. So if there's any emphasis in the Catholic set of lenses, our set of corrective lenses by which in faith we look at the world and try to make sense of our lives and all that happens in it, is that we tend to emphasize a God who is very, very close to us. That is to say, we emphasize a creating God who manifests God, manifests God through people, places, things, and events. We really believe in a intimately relational God who is manifesting God daily, if we only have the eyes to see her, because she wishes to be intimate with all of creation. Now, as Catholics, are we trying to suggest there's no difference between the creation and the creator? Of course not. To say creator is to put you in another whole ballpark. But but the Catholic imagination says, don't forget there's a link. It's what philosophers call the analogical imagination. Analogy, namely you've got two things that are different, God and the world. They are very different. But analogy said, but there's also something that links them. And it's that linkage that we Catholics tend to emphasize. To put it practically, anybody out of the Catholic imagination, whether you are Catholic or like the imagination, sees the material, anything material, including ourselves, as a window on the immaterial and the spiritual. So that the created order becomes a table for experiencing the creator. Whoa. And not that we ever fully understand this, but we gain some grasp of this phenomenon. After all, you and I are made in the image and likeness of God. And the ultimate trump card in the Catholic tradition is this reminder. Our lives only make sense if we are Catholic in light of the story of Jesus, who we understand to be fully human, who has the radical presence and manifestation of God such that we see him as the Messiah, the incarnate one. Well, if the enfleshed one is part and parcel of us, then all of created material reality is a window on God. If that's the big, 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 big picture, then all of creation is good because of the creator. And as Thomas Aquinas reminds us, God distinguished us and linked us to God by two incredible gifts, the ability to think and the ability to choose. And thus, Regis College. Regis College as a Catholic college is dedicated to developing in all of us 
who are employees and to all of those whom we serve to develop and nurture their ability to think critically and to become gifted in their vocations. But no matter what they choose, have the gift of also raising the biggest questions. And this is just a little note here. What's one of the things that ought to regularly distinguish Regis in its curriculum and in our classrooms and outside discussions is that you and I ought to feel incredibly comfortable here raising the biggest questions, the most important ones. Where have we come from? Where are we going? Where is the world going? Why is there injustice? How can we, in fact, heal the brokenness in the world? Those are not routine questions, but they're the questions that ought to animate us. And because every human being is precious, Regis College, besides, quote, forming the mind, is also supposed to be get dedicated to nurturing the whole person, body, soul, psyche. This is no discredit in any way or to demean our producing incredibly skilled and informed pre-professional people. But we fail if we don't do it in a holistic way in the classroom and out of the classroom. I know it became fashionable among some universities and maybe it fits their view that it's only the mind they're after. And if they choose it, so be it. But by God, no Catholic college, and in our case, Regis, should ever say we've done our job because by God, our graduates are bright. <laughs> That's fine or highly skilled, that is great. But we've got a menu that says, we want the totality of you to flourish. Body, soul, and psyche, because we so care about you. Where do the Sisters of St. Joseph fit? <laughs> You can only understand the Sisters of St. Joseph and their extraordinary history by understanding that Catholic nurture out of which that extraordinary movement of the 17th century came. Because of Catholic life, there emerged a group of inspired women, and I would take just what Sister Mary said in opening reflections as we congratulated her the work of God's spirit brought together women who wanted to do the more, <laughs> who were impelled with a sense of mission in relationship to God, who was so present to them in the dispossessed and in the needy. And eventually the coming to America and an incredible mission of bringing education to those who so needed it. And that's why you can begin to then add additional colors to the mosaic that's Regis. Oh, we're a Catholic college, so we share all of the larger assets, including the fact that our ability to believe is never in conflict with our ability to think, and our ability to think is never in conflict with the ability to believe. In fact, we think, the full human being is a person who thinks deeply about faith and also a faith that questions. And that all roads ultimately lead to God if we understand that the search for God ends, excuse me, the search for truth ends in God. But you might wonder, do you mean, Ernie, only Catholics are called, no, 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 no. <laughs> if we're true to the Catholic understanding of things, Catholic means universal. And I'm not saying again, we've always lived this, even today. 
But from its foundation, by the Sisters of St. Joseph, all were welcome. I mean, think about it. 1927 in America, with all of the cultural and social phenomena, all are welcome. Yeah, most of the students were Catholic, but all were welcomed at a time when divisions could easily separate some from being welcomed and others not. And if so, if all are welcome, then on an intellectual level, a good college, a good Catholic college welcomes all pursuit of truth, even pursuit of truth that criticizes belief in God. Because even in that encounter, can fruitful conversation come? I add a note because I'm obsessed with language. Any of my students who get to know me say, oh God, he's at it again. And it's because I'm fascinated by language. Tonight we're having, and I'll initiate a conversation. Conversation comes from the Latin word convitere, from which we get words like conversion and conversation. In its root to turn around, but in its early meanings, also in Middle English, it meant a shared life. To engage in conversation is to have a shared life. Regis College and the model of religious life that the sisters gave us and are still giving us is a life built on conversation, shared life. My side note, if we're not promoting communitarian conversation and encounter with one another in person where it's possible, we're failing in the heart of who we are. Because it's that conversation, whether it's in person here or for those at distance, and that's why it's called at distance, because persons can't be present to the giftedness of being in person to promote appropriate conversation. So the multiple paths, whether it's sociology, psychology, history, biology, chemistry, astronomy, are all holy endeavors, H-O-L-Y, in the Catholic tradition. Because ultimately, if we have the set of lenses to see it, all roads in an ancient world led to Rome. <laughs> in the Catholic vision, all roads in the hard work of seeking the truth lead to God. So a brief note by Ernie, the teacher, and then I'm going to turn to my conversation partners with tag. On a practical note, I have to ask myself, good friends, what difference does it make that I'm at Regis? What difference does it make in the classroom? I think in 2023, just briefly, I shared with my students recently, I look at walking into CH340 or any classroom as sacred space. And I say that, not that it's a novelty, I think it's sacred space whenever people have a focused search for truth and they're gathering together in communal learning. But I have added the word sacred because of the world we live in in 2023. Think about the loss of conversation over the last 10 years. Sherry Turkle, a researcher at MIT, has in fact authored a best-selling book called Reclaiming Conversation. Because she's concerned about growing numbers of young people, as well as adults who are affected by it, who are losing the ability to converse. And her call is not for us to have a mass demonstration and foot stomping on Apple products. That's not her call. But it is to say she wants to bring us back 
to the relational possibilities that happen when people talk to one another in community around matters of significance. Wow. So that people are always valued more than things. At our kind of place, that should be first order. People, conversation before things. This is my own pedagogical note. The last thing I think our students of traditional age, and I speak here only of the residential college, the last thing students aged 18 to 24 at a residential college in 2023 need is more screen time. Because increasing numbers, as Sherry Turkle says, are increasingly uncomfortable with conversation, prefer a texting to talking, and that's verified by my asking students. And the uncomfortability of encountering face-to-face -face other human beings. What a loss. So for me, the excitement is the college gives me and all of us, and this is strictly with the residential program, the opportunity to engage in the radical act of conversation about things that really matter. Wow. And the Sisters of St. Joseph modeled that art from their first gatherings in the kitchen in Le Puy, where at the end of every day where they went out to the quarters, they came back, gathered in the kitchen to pray and converse. Tag, Dan Leahy, what difference, Dan, does being at Regis and your work, what difference does it make? Ernie, that is so unfair. I have to go after you. Thank you for pointing out my sin, Dan. I feel like I want to take a walk around the block and write in my journal for about an hour. No, 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 please, Dan. The important thing is Pope Francis would say the renewal of Catholicism is based on synodality, talking with everybody. And this is all about talking with everybody and your insights and those of the others in conversation about what difference it makes because your voice needs to be heard. Dan. See, even in offering an encouragement, you're still doing it. So thank you, um, a wise person. I will just simply say, and again, I, I really want to hear from so many other people that um, I, I think you're exactly right. And I think a lot of times these conversations help us to understand the gift that we have and the opportunities before us. Um, over spring break, I was part of the what we call the civil rights movement pilgrimage in Atlanta or in Georgia and Alabama. Um, and the phrase every night when we would experience really challenging, difficult uh, parts of history and significance, the phrase that kept coming up every night at reflection was because the truth matters. And I won't, I won't get into a lot of those details now. I invite everyone to come to Regalos on Thursday night. You will hear from our students. But I think that can be said about our school as well and why we're at Regis. I think that our tradition, our values, our mission, that we have an, an important opportunity to share the truth with the world about our students, about our world. It's an important message that a lot of other places who educate don't necessarily include. It's a fundamental, fundamental truth about creation as good, about the human person as good, about the directives to live in community, in justice, characterized by justice, that we are designed for love, we're designed for conversation, we're designed for intimacy and connection. And in this time of increased anxiety and unhappiness with so many of our young people, we have a suggestion to deal with that. And we prepare students not just for a job, but for a life, a meaningful, successful life. And I think that we're always, all of us in each corner of the university are trying to figure out how we can do that together and to do it within our, our work in an even better way. So 
that is so much more. I just want to hear from other folks and I don't know who to tag next. I will let you tag the next person, but thank you for the opportunity. Dan, we thank you very much. Very, very much. Hey, Lisa Ferdy, School of Nursing. How about Lisa's understanding? What difference does all this make? What brought you to Regis, Lisa? Any insights you'd like to share with our good people? Good evening. Uh, I, I suppose I would start by echoing Dan's statement that I, I'm a bit <laughs> taken aback to now be the third person to speak. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly since I have nothing prepared <laughs> except years of theological school. <laughs> <laughs> but I will do my very best. Uh, I suppose from a faculty perspective, I feel increasingly challenged to weigh academic needs, content delivery, while still sponsoring the community that I, I know Regis is and still wants to be, and quite frankly, was the Regis that drew me initially. I'll be honest, I didn't... I very, knew very little of Regis College before I applied to teach at Regis College. I did have a teacher in high school. She taught English, and I knew that she was a Regis College graduate, but that was my only connection to Regis. And then to this day, I, I don't recall doing so, but apparently I had posted my resume, and President Hayes found it and reached out to me. I wasn't even living in the state at the time. And somehow between chatting with President Hayes, uh, arriving at the Western campus for an interview, I left realizing that I was packing up my life and moving to Western, well, not to Western, but to Massachusetts. And I knew New England from, co from college and such, but I didn't know again, much about Regis College, but I knew what I knew was enough for me to want to know more. And I will be honest in saying that what drew me to Regis is still what keeps me at Regis, which is the mission. Wow. Uh, Lisa, you are always prepared, even when it's spontaneous, trust me. Oh, thank you. You're very welcome. Tag Charlene of the School of Business and Communication. Well, thank you, Ernie. I'm so glad you called on Dan first. I was <laughs> hoping, just hoping that it wouldn't be me. Um, I, Charlene, I'm prompted to say, you know what? The funny thing is, we teachers end up being just like our children and our students or right out of a Snoopy cartoon. Please don't call on me first. It's where the funniest thing's going. We really are. I fully get it. I'm with you, Shirley. <laughs> but well, thank you I, for your graciousness. Thank you. Um, Ernie, that was wonderful what you um, delivered here. It was just beautiful. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, I, I grew up in the area, so I knew about Regis when I when I came. I went to a Catholic college. I went to Catholic school from preschool to eighth grade and then mm. Catholic college. So, I mean, I understood what, what it was going to be all about. Um, I just, I think, I think my greatest concern or things I think about often is, you know, when there are, when there are no more, when the sisters are are no longer with us. How how can we sustain and keep keep the mission and keep those values in place without the sisters here? Yeah. And so that's probably the the biggest ongoing ongoing question. And and also, you know, why why do people send their kids to Catholic schools? Why why is that important? And will that continue to be an important factor in the years to come? Mm. You raise very pivotal questions, Charlene. And I know because of our friendship, it's not simply an intellectual question for you. It is a deeply personal one that's lived daily. Um, thank you. Tag Ababa. 
IBM. How did I know you were coming for me? <laughs> <laughs> and special kudos, special kudos to this good woman, because how long have you been at Regis College, Ababa? This is just my second year. Her second year. And I went to invite her. And with a smile, she said, yes. And so we are very grateful because we want voices that have been here, but voices of newness that have brought you. I love it. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity of being here tonight. Um, so for me, what brought me to Regis? It's actually funny. Um, I was in the field. I'm a social worker by training. I was in the field for nine years and was tired of the field. Uh, so I started applying to colleges in hopes to teach. And honestly, it was like, this is not going to happen. It's not an option. You're not going to be teaching, but just do it anyways, right? And I applied to my undergraduate school. I went to Eastern Nazarene College in Quincy. And honestly, I feel like having my experience at ENC has literally paved the way to where I am today, right? Um, wow. It ENC has been a, a lifesaver, a place of just growth in my life, right? Um, and I applied at a job at ENC, got a job there, easily could have gone there. Um, could have been my comfort zone, right? And for me, more than anything, I wasn't I wasn't in a space that I just wanted to be comfortable. I didn't just want to go and teach with my professors that I have wonderful connections with still and not know what would come after that, right? So I took a leap of faith and I was like, you know what? I'm gonna say no to you, ENC, which is super sad because you have played a huge role in my life today, to the, until today, and I chose Regis. And for me, the reason I chose Regis is because of, the incredible team that interviewed me and just the way that they poured into me was wild. The way that they <laughs> spoke life into me and I'm like, wait, are, where am I going? Like, what do you mean you see so much potential in me? And I think that's the greatest part of my story is hearing that I have potential, right? And, and that's all that I want our students to know is that there's so much potential in them, right? And that's why I teach. That's why I have such a heart of for social work and a heart to, to pull out strengths from my students on a daily basis, no matter what their background story is, no matter where they're going, right? After graduation, whatever that might look like. Um, and I think for me, the biggest core value that I really hold on to at Regis is care for all God's creation, right? Mm -hmm. um, from the point of where they are, my hope is to carry out, uh, be a part of carrying them out for the four years of them being at Regis. So um, I don't know if this answers the question, but I hope it does. And I appreciate you. Thank you. You are very welcome, Ababa. You have answered. And anyone who passes by your office sees the effect you have on students who converse with you, whether they are in tears and bringing a problem to you or joyous, they are all better and enriched because they converse with you. I've seen it. Thank and you. Right now, I'm smelling the need for a woman of science who needs to address what difference a scientist can make at a Catholic college. So tag Erin McQuaid. Ernie, I have to tell you that when I told my family, Ernie asked me to be on a panel, they said to me, did you look directly in his eyes again? <laughs> what brought me to Regis College- um, I think Erin- <laughs> I think for those who don't know, you better tell the short story behind the eyes and what the meaning of that is. The short story, and Chris, you might want to chime in. The short story was at an ERC meeting when they needed someone to be chair. I was the only one who looked directly at Ernie. 
and I've learned my lesson. It kind of, Ernie, it's Genesis-like, isn't it? <laughs> Goes yeah, right I was over responsible to that and said, three. would you please become chair? Yes. That's the eyes. But Aaron, please, you have been long associated with Regis. And well, I'd love to hear a woman of science address this. Who brought me to Regis was my dad. My well, dad brought me to Regis to pick up my sister, Colleen, who was a freshman at the time. And then my sister, Kamal, was a junior at the time. What kept me at Regis was Jane Roman, wow. who, despite my getting a 54 on my first organic chemistry test with a 30-point <laughs> scale, she still <laughs> believed in me. And boy, did I work hard to get an A on that second test. And you know what? I suffered. That's what it is. I suffered through that first test. And Ernie, when you were talking about this, first of all, I thought this is so Lenten. And I just finished reading wow. um, a lecture or, or a, a, a written piece by Father Paul Scalia. Yeah. But it's that suffering. Um, you talked about the incarnation, Ernie, and Jesus became human to suffer, suffer more than any of us could even imagine. And then that struggle, you know, Jane saw me through that suffering and through that struggle mm -hmm. and, and motivated me to work very, very hard on that second test and just to progress and improve from there. And then she kept me at Regis. And I think about also what you mentioned, Ernie, truth and conversation and dialogue and reaching out, you know, that that suffering as a young student and, and all of us had, I've, I've had, you know, all of us are not um, free of suffering. It's part of, of, part of our Catholicism, yeah. part of our spirituality. It's what we grow from. Um, but what you said about conversation and dialogue, you know, I thought with the conversation, I thought about the woman at the well in conversation oh, oh. with all people, you know, and we have such a diverse group of students and a diverse faculty. We have a very diverse community and oh, keeping God. that conversation and dialogue open and just, you know, um, the conversation with the woman at the well is one of my favorite dialogues to read. Um, and then also, too, that just when you talked about truth, all I could think of is what's written above the chapel doorways, you know, from John 14. I am the truth, the life and the way. And there it is. And, and I'm so happy that it's there on campus and that will never go away. Oh, Aaron, thank you. Thank no, you. thank you, Ernie. No, I really, you know, that as a woman of science, where in some quarters it's an either or, either you believe in science or you're a person of faith, but never the twain shall meet. You are the living incarnation as any woman or man in the sciences is that says, oh no, no. In fact, it's both and. It's never either or, it's both and. And I will never forget David Morimoto, a colleague years mm -hmm. ago, who told me one day, and for those who didn't know him, David was a distinguished biologist specialty in environmental concerns. And David once said to me, Ernie, do you want to know what led me into faith and the Catholic experience? I said, David, what is it? He said, science. He said, the more I dug, the more doors were opened. And the deeper and deeper I went, and I realized there was always mystery and the more beyond. And I thought that says it all, you know, that says it all. Here's a very bright man of science, a person like you, dedicated to science and seeing ultimacy and all of it. Yeah. There's so many times, especially when I teach the biochem, yeah. where I'm writing on the board and I'm thinking about amino acids and all of these things that are produced within us. And as I'm writing and talking, all I can think of is, God is wicked smart. God is wicked <laughs> smart. All of this come together. 
and I'm not laughing at the truth of it, but my God, talk about Bostonian uh, pronunciation of it. Wicked smart, you got it. I think that ought to be another theological piece that we can chip into the side of the Maria Hall annex. Just chip in along with the values of the sisters. God is wicked smart. That would say <laughs> plenty. Um, Aaron, I think you'd agree with me. I think it's really important to hear from somebody who's dedicated her life to a special way of responding to God in religious life. I'm thinking somebody like Mary L. Murphy might be a good conversation partner. I agree. Sister Mary, <laughs> you're tagged. I guess so. Thank you, Erin. I am so inspired by all of you. And not just in this conversation, but in the conversations that take place on a daily basis, when we, we run into each other, when we meet each other. And I witness the way we respond to our students. And I witness the love and the care and the relationship building that takes place every day. And we don't need a script for it. Mm. We just know that relationship is at the heart of our mission. Thank you again to everybody who, who spoke. I would just want to add that I, again, am inspired by what happens in the classroom, the students that I meet, they give me such hope. Mm. The students give me great hope personally and professionally. I'm blessed to work with students who are gifted and the conversations that we are able to have and the freedom with which they take place, amazing, amazing conversations. And I learn something new every single day. And I always look forward to having my class contributing to the common good. I find that over 50 years ago, the Sisters of St. Joseph planned for this day, the day when no Sister of St. Joseph would be in any of our sponsored ministries. We were planning this 50 years ago. The spirit clearly was involved in our conversations. Now, did we really know that we would all live into it? Probably not. But what we have lived into is passing on our legacy to all of our colleagues. And then for me to be able to say, I witness it daily at Regis College. Not only do I feel that I have been able to love all of you. I feel that love in return. And so um, as I get ready to say goodbye without knowing that was going to happen, I just say, thank you all so much. Thank you for the relationship. And yes, the sisters are about meeting the needs of the times. And so the needs of the times change and just last Sunday night, I was watching one of my favorite programs called The Midwife. Oh. And I don't always catch the accent, and nor would they be able to catch mine, I'm sure. <laughs> but, but the end of the show is always a wonderful quote. And last Sunday, they said, change is not a threat. Mm. It is a chance if we embrace it. Wow. And then we begin again. And so with that, I say, thank you for allowing me to be a part of your lives. And I will be forever grateful. Wow. The gospel values are the values of the sisters of St. Joseph. And so welcoming all without distinction is a gospel value. The sisters of St. Joseph paid attention to the gospels. We'll continue to pay attention to the gospels. And 50 years ago, when we said our partners in ministry yeah. will be the ones who will carry this on, we weren't clear as to what that meant, but we will we'll be forever grateful having lived it. 
So thank you all very much. Amen. Um, Mary, uh, in Italian, a favorite phrase is mille grazie. And I think all of us really mean it. A thousand thank yous, a thousand thank yous. Yeah. Thank you. um, there needs to be a young voice from the School of Health Sciences. And Marie Gabor is about to offer some reflections of someone new to our community. Tag Marie. <laughs> Ernie, I don't, I don't know how I'm gonna say anything after Sister Mary just said <laughs> all these beautiful words. I mean, you know, I, I don't, <laughs> I don't know where to start. Well, you're uh, just, I mean, I, 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 let me diminish you. You're made in the image and likeness of God. I mean, that's just it. I mean, it's just not much going for you. So <laughs> what little going for you made in the image and likeness of God, we'll listen to you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so the, I think I like the question was, the, what does Regis mean to you? Like, how'd you get yeah. here, right? Or what uh, difference does it make? Okay. Or what, any, any take you'd like to give to all of us? Yeah. So, because this is what year for you, Marie? Um, one and a half. One and a half. Yeah, one and a half. Um, I've known about Regis since I was 10 years old. Ever since I could like see beyond the window of the car, you know, was yeah. 10. Uh, and we drove to it every single Sunday, pa past it uh, for church. Oh, wow. I always thought I was going to go as a student to oh, Regis. Oh my gosh. I got, I got in, um, but I, you know, God didn't want me on that in, you know, just to start at Regis, but I eventually would end up there. Um, for grad school, I applied to Regis. I was going to apply to Regis College, and then it, that didn't happen. Sorry, I went to our competitor, LaSalle. Is that even a competitor or no? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I think any college in the Boston area, Charlene can probably confirm this, is a competitor in one way or another. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, but, you know, I was looking for jobs after COVID and then uh, stumbled upon Regis. So I applied in September, didn't hear back for like a month. And I was like, okay, um, what's the worst that can happen? I'm just going to find out who's the person in charge hiring. And that was you know, Dr. Laura Burke, and I emailed her. Yes. I was like, hi, I'm really interested. I want to apply. And then I, I applied, you know, my application there. And then like two days later, I got an interview. And then like a month later, I got the job. So I really felt the hand of God um, in there. Um, and I will say that all the schools that I've been to, the distinction at Regis is the core values, um, especially the serving thy dear neighbor without distinction wow i started here a year and a half ago i also had no idea what i was doing like at all uh and anyone who i would go to would answer my question they wouldn't look at me with judgment oh how come you don't know this you know like that like the talk that we have in our head that doesn't yes. actually exist anywhere else yes um, yeah, and I've just really felt like it's it's my home here, and I've been praying so long to find a place where I belong, and I know that uh, God has has brought me here um, for that, and I only hope to you know do a lot of things here in His name and whatnot. So um, yeah, I I really feel the distinction, like even comparing like LaSalle because you know again competitor and also private school like ten yes. minutes down the road. I didn't really see big of a community vibe there that I do like, you know, here and support oh, not, God. not discrediting this no, out, no, 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 no. you know, um, experience with it. But uh, the, I do, I truly do feel like, you know, deep, deep roots in the core values. Um, and that's really what sets Regis apart from all the other institutions I've been at and all the inst other institutions I've taught at. Wow. So, yeah. Marie, you have said plenty. I hope so. I think you I was rambling. <laughs> you will continue to be very fine contributor to Regis. And for Marie, I want to turn to another M who will provide very distinctive insight. Michelle Cook, please jump on board. Ernie, did you not get the message I sent you? 
Were you not paying attention? <clears throat> I deliberately turn down <laughs> messages that say no. <laughs> I said to him, don't even think about it. But apparently he did. And he decided sure. against my wisdom. Okay, so here's my take. I grew up around here and my sisters went to Font Bonne Academy. Wow. I went to St. Clair's. The difference between those two schools were, was amazing. So my, I had a fabulous education at St. Clair's. I was frightened the entire four years. They were scary Irish nuns. <laughs> Now there's a gap between me and, and the rest of my siblings. So I was in college the first time I went to Font Bonne and I was going to like a concert my sister was singing in. And I was like, just sort of looking around and I was like, oh, oh, oh. See at St. Clair's, they only really were focused on the academics yeah. where at Font Bonne, it was completely different. They didn't care whether you, if you were good at one thing, that was great. If you were good at something different, that was also great. And even as a, you know, 20 year old, I could figure that out when I walked in oh. there. And I remember saying to my mother, how come I ended up at St. Clair's? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, cause you got that damn scholarship. <clears throat> But that it was a big difference. It really was. And I, I guess it shocked me. I was very jealous because, you know, you could do something other than, you know, go to the board and do a geometry problem and yes. hope that nobody yelled at you. Um, it was very different. And, and it, it carried through to Regis too. And it was, it was very much the same. And I remember when I first arrived at Regis, going up to Sister Camilla, because there was a nun at Font Bonne who who was a um, she was in charge of the corral, and I thought it was Sister Camilla, <laughs> I was Sister Camilla, and it was not. <laughs> Carmela would be very impressed that she's also now distinguished in music besides education. That's right. That's right. That's right. But that's that's you know, and and now I'm at Regis. I went to Regis for my master's degree. And, you know, and the thing I remember the most about that was when I called someone up, they said to me, this is the quote, don't worry, Michelle, we'll get you through. And they wow. did, you know, wow. and I mean, at the time I was a young mother and I was like, I had one kid, two kids in diapers and one on the way. I mean, you know, and they did. They got wow. me through. Wow. Michelle, thank you for <laughs> heartfelt. No always heartfelt convictions. And like Cana, the last does not mean the least. Dear Joseph, my colleague and friend, would you finish the conversation so that we can toss the table open to all? Joseph Draper. What difference, Joe? You, you really went there, didn't you? Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, you said yes, and I You can run, him. but you cannot hide, hide from, from him. Yeah, I, I got that, Michelle. I'm right on it. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the things that uh, I, I like to do um, is uh, sort of spread the influence that uh, I, I experienced when I first came to Regis in 2007, and it was it was the generous spirit of people. Um we we were uh, my wife and I we we you know we had uh, four kids in the house and uh, we actually qualified for food stamps and uh, one of the nuns uh, here at Regis and I will remain unnamed uh, would would leave me a uh, bowl of soup in the faculty refrigerator uh, unasked she just had my name on it and uh, th that was just very very generous and that, that's that's not the least of it there there are other people who just have this this generous spirit. Uh, I remember there even even the president found me a place to stay uh, because I you know to come down to Regis uh, from Maine, um, and I I've noticed that that's uh, that's pretty common. That's not an unusual. It's not an unusual thing. I've seen that generosity uh, of other people sharing sharing that, uh, and I just find that to be uh, a remarkable 
it's, it's a remarkable trait amongst a number of faculty who are by nature prickly, uh, who, who are who are by <laughs> nature, uh, um, you know, who, who who see conflict not as a problem, but as a, as, as necessary for building relationships. There's a, there's a prickly side to, to faculty that's that that, but it never it, it never uh, masked or hid uh, what what I see is this, this generosity and. Uh, I, I, that's one of the things that I, uh, I and, and, the, and the last thing I'll say is it was funny when I called my mother in 2007 and said, you know, I, I got this uh, position at Regis. She goes, Regis College? You mean the one in Weston? I said, yeah. She goes, my sister graduated from there. Now, this is my mother in Spokane, Washington, wow. right, at, who raised us in Montana, had a sister that went to Regis uh, and graduated uh, in the early 50s. And that, that was kind of a cool connection. But uh and, 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 and no less generous is uh, Ernie Colomati, his time, his, his mentoring, and uh, in his counsel. And I want to thank you for that, Ernie, and everybody on the panel. You are very welcome, Joe. And um, as Sister Marielle Murphy, Sister Betsy Conway, who have served so well, regularly remind me and remind all of us, you know, when all is said and done, it's all about relationships. And so Joseph, as to my colleagues and friends, right back at you. And so Christine, our good MC, we've done Ernie, we've done conversation partners. It's now time to enlarge the whole table <laughs> for any and all questions for insights, as well as a question that we need also to ask. We have highlighted some real gifts. Where can we do better? Where are we not where we ought to be? That's also critical in engendering new life. Yeah. Christine. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Thank you to all of those faculty participants for and staff participants, of course, for for sharing that. I'm happy to uh, call on those that I see raise their hand to contribute here. So Mary Wu, love to hear from you. Thank you, Christine. Um, and, and thank you so much, Ernie. I mean, that really was I, in many ways just simply profound. I mean, I, I loved every minute of it. I held on to your every word. Um, I thought your conversationalists and partners were wonderful and just raw in terms of your response to Ernie and really just great ways of thinking about um, Regis and how we approach our work at Regis. Um, I guess I would just reiterate right now that this is truly a moment. Okay, this is truly a moment um, beyond the fact that it's Heritage Week and it's a week or two weeks that we really truly honor and celebrate the Sisters of St. Joseph of Boston. Um, with Mary's uh, vote of confidence and presidency for the next five years of her uh, wonderful religious order, um, we will have gone from 80 sisters in the 1940s to zero sisters being at Regis after Mary's departure. So for all of us on the Zoom call, I'd, I'd like you to think about that because um, when Ernie says, we are it, <laughs> we are it. <laughs> I mean, we are it. And we are now preaching to the choir because you're all here and you're yeah. all here for a reason because you're interested in um, Regis, you're interested in these values and this mission and this legacy and the charism of the sisters and how we want to really internalize that and, and continue to operationalize it in every way we can possibly do it. Um, but we are it. So I, I guess I would just suggest that we all really think about how we as individuals can, can um, turn this incredible conversation and dialogue around into ourselves and how we all can really in our own ways continue to move um, this important legacy forward. Um, I always say we we not only, you know, talk to talk, we walk the walk. And we do it in so many different ways, so many different ways, whether it's in the classroom, whether it's the way we res respond to each other or respect each other. I, I always offer the image up of there's, there's, it's not an image, it's a reality. There's never been an, a time when I've um, 
began to walk into College Hall and a student has not stopped to open the door for me or run to open the door to me or open the door to me as we may have been leaving the building together, but we kind of got there at the same time, the student jumps ahead and opens the door. And so I always feel like that image is so representative Regis. You know, we have opened a door, we've opened the door for our students and they are here. And, um, you know, it's nice for us to continue to think about ways in which we can always and I love this holistic way of helping them to move through Regis, um, you know, with this important mission in their hearts and minds and with these values in their hearts and minds. And um, as we say in our mission statement, you know, contributing to that, you know, the common good, you know, in, in a very specific or very global way. And so um, I just challenge all of us, I guess, to really think about this conversation and think about the ways in which we individually and collectively um, can continue to move this legacy forward without the presence of the sisters on our campus. Very and nice. I'm gonna start to cry, I think, so I gotta stop, <laughs> but I really feel that yeah. deeply. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Mary Lou, for, you know, really, encouraging this event to move forward. Um, thank you so much for your guidance on it, as well as kind of your, your inspiration here. It's been truly wonderful. Uh, so Professor Naomi Cooker, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Thank you so much, Ernie. Um, Mary Lou, having just heard from you, um, I didn't, didn't want to uh, let go of the opportunity to speak to what uh, it's been said here tonight, um, and this is an incredible gathering. Um, Ernie, thank you for your um, wonderful opening and um, having this conversation and, and igniting this conversation. Um, I don't know if I, um, I'll just say there's a little legacy here too for me. I was actually hired by Sister Betty Colley. Wow. Um, yeah, and uh, so I, and I remember that that time well, and I find myself here um, also, I guess what I wanna say is what I like to do is inspire the gifts that the students come with already. And that part of this mission and the core values is seeing, and you said it in the beginning, Ernie, that it's sacred ground and uh, what I experience with you and with a lot of my colleagues is that when we meet in the hall, it's sacred ground in that conversation. And one of the things that um, I would invite everybody to do, and we're inviting our students to do, and um, Dr. Fitzgerald is instrumental in this, and that is we are officially relaunching the Regis Herald, which has long been an independent newspaper of Regis College. And when I say independent, I do mean independent. And there was mention here um, several times about the truth. Um, Dan, you, you brought it up with you know, your, your time uh, down south, you know, because the truth matters, you know, facts matter. And there is a, and I'm gonna ex, um, expand on this tomorrow night. So tomorrow night, you're all invited uh, seven o'clock in College Hall 202. Uh, we are celebrating the relaunch of the Regis Herald with Amaka Ubaka, who's agreed to come and be with our students. She's our commencement speaker, very generous with her time. And one of our students is going to interview her. Um, but that the Society of Professional Journalists, and I think um, Fitz, you can, you know, uh, we're journalists here and I know in some ways journalism is like academic, uh, research and integrity, you know, we're seeking something. And one of the tenets of journalism is to seek the truth and report it. Yep. And, you know, so I, I want to, um, you know, with, with my colleagues, all of us to foster that in our students. Um, and, you know, I find that they, you know, that, that it leads with curiosity, it leads with questions, um, and it might make some of us, and I'm gonna like, including me, uncomfortable the yeah. questions they might have asked or the way that they, you know, the stories that they might 
want to write um, because they're seeking that truth. They, they want those answers. So um, together, if we can support them, um, and this is responsible journalism, by the way, um, you know, and I think it's really important, especially in this stage, to open that dialogue, that I hope that this will be a forwarding leg legacy of the sisters who are beyond courageous. You know, if we can borrow a modicum of, uh, if I can borrow that word that you used earlier, Ernie, you know, a modicum of courage that they had and have in their work of social social justice and this getting, you know, getting here to Regis College, um, that, you know, that we can do something um, and they're, you know, small steps, incremental steps, you know, you know, conversations. And and that's how I think we can we can do that. But to have this opportunity for our students, I think is really important. So thank you for letting me take this time to to share that. Naomi, thank you very much. And as someone who's been at Regis multiple decades, I lamented the loss of the Regis Herald. And I found it interesting that a recent gospel proclamation for the Lenten season at Eucharist is the Lazarus story. So for you and Fitz and all who are involved, it's metaphorically the raising of Lazarus at Regis. The Herald lives and that voice needs to be heard. Yeah. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, I don't know, Professor Christopher Kubik, did you wanna continue? I saw a hand earlier. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, thanks, Christine. Um, and thanks, uh, Ernie and all the other presenters. Um, it, I mean, yeah, where, why don't we have more time for these conversations amongst <laughs> us so we can be so inspired uh, routinely for our students? Um, I think um, what I want to bring up is, you know, the question that Ernie says, what aren't we doing well and, and what should we think about? And, and I really, from the bottom of my heart, this is this has been a lovely hour and a half. And Sister Mary, I'm going to miss you so much. Yep. Um, but um, so I think about, um, I thought about it for uh, many years, but it um, kind of resurfaced when I read the Chronicle this morning about this notion of grades um, and um, our first years and our first gens that um, have been like behind computer screens for years and might not be able to know how to converse and yet we throw them in these situations. And when I think about the title, you know, our mission, our values, our classrooms, um, should our classrooms for that first year experience, and I don't mean the class, I mean the first year, what are, you know, however we define that first semester, first 18 months, should we be focused on that grading effort versus community and conversation and efforts to align with, you know, what students know or don't know about higher ed and the realities of what COVID has done over the last few years. It's a it's an interesting dynamic. Um, I don't teach first year students, um, but I know that they are not the same first year students that we've all taught for many years. And, and um, you know, in the spirit of what do we value and where's the compassion? I, I don't know what the right answer is, but I, I bring it up as a question. Mm. Excellent question, Chris. Really critical question. Absolutely. Are there any others who would like to contribute or point out maybe areas where we need to continue to grow and develop or maybe where we really are defective? I just want to, um, hey everybody. Uh, Chris, that was great. Hi, Bernard. Uh, hey everybody, hey. hey. Um, I, I do want to say, Chris, um, you know, that that's the challenge. Um, um, the loss of Sister Mary, and it's going to be a loss um, for a Catholic institution to have no persons, persons part of religious orders is 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 devastating. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think that at the height of my time here, 
Ernie hired me in 2010. We, I think we had seven sisters, if I count all the yeah. persons who worked here. Now there, yes. there'll, be, there'll be none. Um, so that's a t- tremendous loss. And the challenge is, um, going back to what Chris said so eloquently, is how do we continue the legacy in the classroom? And I feel like the, an easy start is to put the charism, the principles in every classroom. Mm. You know, we have we have we have a little sign there that talks about security measures, which is important. Don't don't get me wrong, but having those principles there is a start. You know, one one of my Chris, I do teach first year students, and uh, one of my students said, coming from the high school that was uh, Catholic in New Hampshire, Regis is Catholic light, mm. oh, Catholic light, and um, that resonated with me. You know. Um, she said, where's the presence? That's something we should think about as an institution. So uh, Chris, right on, classroom. Um, but it's going to be a challenge to carry on the legacy because, yeah, this, this thing that started in 19, what, 27? Seven. Seven? 20, wow. The, I can't the, believe the, there were eight, 80 persons here. I never knew that. That blows my mind. And now none? tremendous lacuna in our institution it's going to be a lot of work to to continue that and i don't know if we're up to the challenge and so um time will tell bernard you raise a very good question because i've heard that word kind of qualitative evaluations in terms of the public imaging of different institutions are they strong in identity moderate light etc that opens a whole can of interesting questions too. For example, you're right. And it was brought up by students in a public discussion some years ago. Why aren't there more visible signs in the classroom of our identity? A simple thing as one student said, I thought as a Catholic college, uh, you would have a religious imaging occasionally in the classroom. And I could not say because once upon a time there was. And another one said to me, I couldn't avoid in my high school, for example, seeing the values imprinted on the walls. And and it's true, our classrooms are uh, painted in a kind of neutral colors, but there's nothing distinctive. And that's not to suggest classrooms become chapels, they're not. But on the other hand, if we're thinking about the larger Catholic tradition, We've married the arts, music, drama, theater, art. Have we overlooked that possibility here at Regis? Or even a wilder one, how about in future planning that we have an extraordinary place of worship on campus? One that is really architecturally extraordinary that would also be welcoming all interesting in terms of capital development. So I think you open an interesting question. What what in terms of the difference might we continue to build and develop on? Thank you. Christine, I've noticed we're at 7.33. We are, we're at 7.30, so we are at time here. Um, I really appreciate everyone's insights here, the questions. And of course, what you all do for our students and each other every day. At the Center for Instructional Innovation, sometimes we say we just need to make a space, right? We need to make a space and amazing things happen when we bring the faculty together. And I really think that's um, an example of what happened here tonight. So I really appreciate this. Uh, Thank you, Ernie. Uh, Thank you, thank you. I don't think any of us can thank you enough for leading this, for bringing everyone here together tonight. A wonderful event to be a part of, of course, and as I said, it was recorded and it will be made available to all of you who came as well as as part of that ACSSJ resource that we were talking about. Uh, This may be one of the resources that we could share as well. Um, So I would like to say thank you to everyone again. Um, And Ernie, uh, if you want to make any closing comments, please feel free. Um, I think we have said plenty because all who have contributed or even in your thinking and presence, you have said so much. And for that richness, thanks be to God. Now go and be dismissed in God's presence. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.